today to introduce Jakob Weichel as our seminar speaker. Um, Jakob is a professor at the Sorbonne University and a member of the Laboratoire Casa Rossel in Paris at the, uh, yeah, the ENS. He's uh, been really a pioneer in kind of developing um, new technologies for quantum science and engineering with uh, cold atoms in settings such as um, microchip-based uh, uh, atom traps with applications to atomic clocks, portable atomic clocks, um, and I think the main topic of this talk today will be uh, new technologies for getting strong atom-light coupling and using those to make uh, interesting many-body entangled states and experiments with cold atoms. So with that, I will pass it to you. Thank you, Monica. Oh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, see so, so many of you, uh, many, many more than I might have my talk at the West uh, <laughs> Sunday, <laughs> the Sunday night, so thanks for being here. Uh, so, as Monica said, I'd uh, uh, like to introduce you to, to a uh, uh, kind of uh, micro uh, cavity, fiberglass micro cavity that we've been uh, uh, developing in, in, in Paris and uh, the experiments that we are doing with it. And um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll highlight two, two experiments one uh, uh, more about entanglement and one about the application to photonic uh, blocks. But in the first place, why should we be talking about cavities? Uh, at all, uh, well, um, just because um, atom photon interaction is uh, everywhere in, in, in quantum technology, uh, as you know, and it's never strong enough. So, uh, whether it's for quantum memories and, uh, or, or uh, qubit detection, uh, you always want that um, strong and, uh, uh, interaction at the level of, of single atoms and, and single photons, and that means um, that you want to concentrate your field and you want to, to, uh, to be able to, to get the most uh, information out of the uh, photons that have interacted um, uh, with your material qubits. And, and, and that's where cavities come into play because they allow you to, uh, uh, to, to improve this co coherent part of the interaction that you, uh, that you get by, by uh, recirculating the field um, uh, so in, um, uh, have it in, interact multiple times with the, with, with the atom before it comes out, uh, hopefully it comes out uh, through one, one of the neurons. And, and so the, the you know, kind of universal uh, figure of merit in, in um, uh, cavities that are used uh, in, in that way is that um, you, you compare the, the coherent interactions, also the single photon uh, Rabi frequency, um, uh, the, the, the coherent coupling you compare to the geometric mean of the incoherent uh, couplings that you uh, that you also have, which come uh, from the cavities, kappa the uh, dk rate of the, of the cavity, gamma the dk rate of the, uh, of the atom. And um, uh, the strong coupling uh, regime can be defined as a 
dream uh, where this uh, C is uh, uh, the scope of relativity C is larger than one, and that's usually where you want to be uh, um, because you want to be coherent. And so, what does that mean when you have an uh, atomic emitter uh, or, or any point like emitter actually that, uh, that has a um, scattering cross section uh, sigma naught? Uh, where this, uh, here's how this uh, probability scales um, with cavity parameters. Um, uh, so you need to compare the, the sigma naught to the, to the cross section of the of the mode uh, in the cavity. So so that gave us very small uh, uh, mode cross sections. Uh, and then, of course, it's proportional to the cavity mass, so the better you, the, the mirror, so the higher uh, the cooperativity. And so, um, in, in order to concentrate that small, make, make this W node small, uh, that's why a magnetality is coming into play. And that explains why, uh, for, for a long time now, um, there's a lot of development uh, to, to make better cavities, better suited for, for, for increasing this, uh, this cooperativity, uh, because it's such an enabling tool. Um, for, 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 for a lot of different um, uh, quantum operations. And um, many, many of these uh, cavities that have been developed also rely on concentrating the field with some kind of photonic structure, um, because then you can get to, to even some wavelength uh, concentration of the field. Uh, but of course, uh, the catch there is that if you use um, this kind of approach, uh, then the big part of the field is confined uh, to within some material. And, um, and the part of the field that you uh, need to exploit to, to couple your emitter to uh, is located at the interface um, to, the, to the free space, typically at the, you know, uh, something like only, only nanometers or uh, hundreds of nanometers at best uh, from, from the surface. So, so if you're working with, um, uh, with atoms, uh, that's not a good place to be uh, because then you get interactions with the material and so we were thinking, wouldn't it be nice uh, to, have, to have an open uh, access cavity that still has a microscopic, uh, this microscopic kind of, um, of, of field concentration. And, and, and so um, the, the idea that we wanted to explore was to, to realize a mirror uh, right on the tip of an optical fiber. So that then, uh, you know, by having two of these fibers face to face, you would be, uh, you get a, a microscopic cavity mode that is automatically uh, fiber coupled, or you could also use it actually coupled to some uh, solid state object <coughs> with a mirror layer underneath, what they call graph mirror, then having, having your emitters here, and then you can make a kind of uh, scanning cavity microscope of the fiber coming from above. And um, so after a few, uh, I mean, then, then okay, <coughs> the idea is simple enough, but, but you have to realize it. And um, we made several uh, um, moderately successful attempts, and, and, and then we came up with this idea of um, of uh, laser machining the, the mirror surfaces uh, using a CO2 laser. That turned out to be uh, quite, uh, to, to work quite well. So now I'll tell you about, uh, a little bit about these cavities. And, um, and then in the second part, I'll come to um, the experiments that you've been doing with them. So um, once again, the idea is really simple. You, you just take a CO2 laser, you shoot at your fiber tip, and uh, uh, you look what come, comes out. And then it turns out you, you can find a regime where um, you get this kind of uh, little, little uh, concave depression on the tip of your fiber. So that's a, that, that's a normal optical fiber, 125 micron di diameter. You see you have a mirror here which has like 100 micron di diameter, and, and there's a radius of curvature that is really small. And the nice thing is at the same time, uh, you, you get a really good uh, surface quality. Um, here's, an, here's an optical profiler <coughs> that, that, that gives you the idea. Uh, and, and, and here's some more uh, quantitative um, uh, data. So, so this is the kind of, of, of profile that you get. Um, it's it's uh, quite well fitted by, by, by a Gaussian. Uh, that's not obvious at all, at all, because actually what happens there uh, during this laser shooting uh, is a highly nonlinear uh, process that is a combination of material evaporation and uh, smoothing uh, occurring to, to local melting close to the surface. Right? It's not at all obvious uh, that such a regime uh, would exist at all. And uh, when we tried to model this, actually, you know, um, we didn't get very far because it's so non-linear. Uh, but if I had known how complicated this physics is, uh, I'm not sure I would have even tried to. Uh, so but sometimes it's good to, to, to be naive. And, and so um, 
um, just just by trying it, we, uh, we we found that we could make these structures. And by, uh, when we look at the uh, surface roughness, uh, like um, here we did with the uh, AFM, uh, then uh, we consistently find the surface roughness uh, uh, at or below uh, 0.2 nanometers RMS. And then from from the softness, you, you can estimate the, uh, the the scatter losses that you get, and and, and they are really low. And in the meantime, this has been confirmed by um, applying um, you know high quality uh, dielectric coatings to, uh, to 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 these structures. Um, and um, PNS values have been measured up to about uh, two hundred thousand, uh, which is indeed the the order of magnitude that you expect in, uh, in the surface roughness. At the same time, you can make um, radii of curvature down to two or even below 10 microns, which means that your waist size can be, can be smaller than uh, uh, one and a half microns, uh, probably smaller still, it's, um, in, uh, the, uh, it hasn't been, hasn't been reached yet. And that's a regime of parameters that you, that you couldn't get from, from classical super polishing. Um, the best surface roughness that, that can be done with any technique is, is, is just a little bit higher than that, but it cannot be applied uh, to, to such a small structure. So, um, so here we are now. Uh, now we have these mirrors. Now we combine them into cavities. Uh, here, for example, so what they can look like is uh, here's one uh, cavity that we made recently. So here are uh, shear fields, those that are uh, used to do cavity length, which is the only adjustable parameter, and all the rest is. Uh, this, this move down, and in this particular uh, one, we have, we have this aspheric lens here, uh, which is which is pre-aligned so that we can um, um, get high-resolution imaging of whatever happens here in the gaffet in the final. Uh, here, here's a realization of this of this the second mode that that, that I showed uh, before, where you have a, um, a, a semiconductor surface. <coughs> With a mirror and you come from above with one fiber and you can make a fiber a cavity, a fiber <coughs> cavity at any point you like by, by scanning uh, across the surface. So uh, cooperativities that have been realized in, in uh, atomic experiments <coughs> with such cavities are um, up to 200 currently, but when you uh, look at what, what can be done with, uh, with the demonstrated values of uh, finesse and, and, and waste, it should be possible to go um, uh, at least an order of magnitude higher still. Um, so these are encouraging values, and, and indeed, um, um, the, 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 you know, the combined properties of these cavities have been, uh, uh, or a lot of people in, in, uh, in, in, in this field are all working with these cavities. Some of them are working with cavities that, that we, uh, we make for them, others have started to produce them uh, on your own, and now they are being used for a wide range of, of emitters, ranging you know, from, uh, from cold atoms to carbon nanotubes, and these centers, and they are also being used for, for uh, cavity optomechanics, uh, including with uh, uh, superfluid uh, liquid helium. So, so there's a lot of cool physics going on with these uh, fiber cavities, which is a nice thing. Uh, recent developments include uh, improving the um, cavity to fiber coupling, which can be uh, very high even without doing anything but uh, you know, the mirror directly on the fiber tip. Um, but um, you know, in, in that way, you get um, you get good coupling for, for specific uh, cavity parameters. But if you want, uh, if you don't want these parameters and still want a good um, uh, fiber coupling, <coughs> then you can um, actually uh, adapt the the, the standard uh, macroscopic optic, uh, optics uh, way of, of doing uh, mode matching between uh, a, a free space mode and a cavity. You can you can adapt it to the to these fiber cavities by combining. Uh, um, um, Grin fiber, which has the whole of the length, and um, uh, and a um, multi-mode fiber, or actually a, you know, just a, a stretch of, uh, of of high quality glass that uh, acts as the free space region, and then on uh, on the top of this part of the coreless fiber, you, you realize your mirror, and then there you are. You can realize uh, um, coupling efficiencies uh, above ninety percent with that method, uh, with um, a wide range of, of uh, cavities. Another thing that um, um, was recently um, developed and that we actually developed in order to make to, to be able to have longer uh, fiber cavities was to all, you know for longer cavity you also need a, a bigger 
uh, mirror diameter bigger than what you can get with just a single laser shot. So we started shooting multiple times at the same surface. And that, um, here's a little movie that shows how, uh, you know, uh, by adding up uh, shot by shot, uh, you can, um, you can uh, get a better and better approximation of your target shape, which in this case, case was, a, uh, was a spherical mirror. Um, uh, as I showed you, I mean, the, the standard form that you get from a single shot is, a, is, a, is a Gaussian shape. That's not what you want for a mirror. Spherical is uh, better. Now we can make spherical mirrors to, to very good approximation. Here's a residual of um, um, uh, hundred micron diameter uh, spherical shape produced in that way. You see that you have uh, below 20, 20 microns the deviation from the target shape over, over this uh, over this full, full region. That's what allows us now to, to make longer cavities than before. So, so um, you see that there are several things are happening to, to make to, uh, to uh, to carry it more, more widely uh, applicable, but you can also make more, more crazy things like this array of, uh, uh, of, of micro lenses of, of, of mirror shapes on, on the tip of the fiber. I don't know what it's good for yet. Or you can use it as a kind of a pencil sharpener so that you remove material around the mirror so that, so that it becomes easier to you know, access the region close to the, um, close, close to the mirror. Okay. So uh, that was my first part on the cavities themselves. So, so then, uh, what do we do with them? Um, I mean, among all these things that you can uh, use cavities for, the, like building quantum memories, uh, repeaters, detection, all that, um, one thing that occupies a special place and is close to my heart, uh, um, and also to yours, Monica, <laughs> that, that's um, using using the cavity uh, as an effective interaction that allows you to create uh, uh, multi-particle entanglement. Uh, in, uh, in, in an ensemble of atoms. And um, there are several ways uh, that you can do that, all, all based on, uh, uh, on optical cavity QED, uh, <coughs> which, as you know, I mean, is a venerable uh, um, subject to some, some, some eminent uh, physicists who, who established the, the basis of it. And um, uh, as you know, when you, have, when you are in a, in a regime of strong enough coupling, then um, just like uh, uh, whenever you, you couple two oscillating systems, um, uh, you, get a, you get a splitting of the resonance, so, so, um, uh, which in this context is called, uh, is called the vacuum Rabi splitting. And uh, so what, what does that mean uh, in the case of an atomic system where, um, you know, think, uh, to be a little bit more concrete, think of a situation where you have a, an atom that has a hyperfine uh, split uh, ground state that you can use as a qubit. And then you have an optical transition um, co connecting one of these qubit states to, to some, some excited state, and that's what the cavity is resonant with. Um, now, um, if, if, you're, if you're working in, in, in that regime, then uh, the first approximation, you can just forget the zero state here. Only the one state is, uh, is, is coupled to the cavity. Um, and if you are at resonance, then you will, uh, then you will get, the, get this vacuum army splitting, or more generally, um, if you look at the um, en energy eigenstate of the coupled eigenstates of the coupled system as a function of the uh, of the cavity detuning, then uh, here for zero detuning, uh, as to that will give you this vacuum Rabi splitting, um, and and you can see how 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 it evolves when you go away from resonance, um, um, and also when you increase the number of atoms in um, in, in the cavity. Uh, then, as long as the excitation is weak enough that you, uh, you, know, you have at, at most one, one, one photon in the cavity, then just um, all this atomic ensemble acts like one super atom. Uh, it just, you just get the same kind of coupling, but, but uh, with an increased uh, uh, coupling value. that increases with the square root of the number of, um, of atoms in the cavity. So um, that means that um, the resonance frequency of this cavity uh, reacts to uh, 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 different states, so, so, so states of the fixed number uh, of um, atomic excitations here in this, uh, in this one state. That's what you are sensitive to with your cavity. So, so the natural basis for, uh, for, for looking at the physics uh, is the thickest state basis uh, represented here on a, on a generalized law sphere, you know, where, where the, uh, the uh, symmetric state of these n atoms are represented as a spin n half. And um, so, uh, with this, um, uh, what do you do with this cavity uh, 
um, uh, producing this, this interaction. Well, here's a, here's a very um, elementary example, but which, uh, which already gets you very far. Uh, suppose you, we, use a, we use a resonant cavity, and we are in the strong coupling regime. Uh, now we have our n atoms sitting, sitting in the cavity, and we have a probe beam that is also uh, resonant with this transition, um, and, and we're measuring uh, transmission facility. Now, if all these atoms are in the zero state, as I told you, it's as if they weren't there, so, so your, pre, um, you, your, your probe beam uh, being resonant with the cavity it will be uh, transmitted, uh, and that's it. Now, if you put just one atom in, into this one state, uh, then your probe beam is no longer resonant with this coupled system and will now be reflected. And, and this reflection will be actually uh, uh, quite, quite complete, so you get a very high contrast. Um, and so this simple effect uh, make, makes an excellent single uh, uh, qubit detector uh, with a detection error that can be uh, uh, in the 10 to the minus 4 regime, uh, which is as good as the best um, ion trans uh, detectors. Uh, uh, but still better than that, um, because uh, these atoms actually never see the resonant light, because either they are in this state, then the light is in the cavity but it's not resonant, or in, in that state here, uh, uh, the light is resonant but that doesn't even enter the cavity. Uh, this, this effect just means that uh, you, you can do this detection uh, with uh, very little spontaneous emission. You can get actually uh, into a regime where you have less than one spontaneous photon um, uh, for, for uh, for detectivity uh, that has, a, uh, that has a, um, an error of, being, uh, of less than 10%, 10 even with this uh, cavity that we had at the time, which you know, uh, still wasn't as good as what we can do now. And uh, in principle, this, uh, the, the scaling of the spontaneous emission, you can see, uh, scales down to uh, as, as one of, a, uh, of the, co the cooperativity. So you can get into regimes of, of, of very good uh, uh, quantum non denominator a detection of, of your qubit state, you can detect your qubit, and the only uh, variable that you will perturb um, is, is the one that you are measuring, so it it's, comes very close to being an ideal projective measurement. Now, um, as you may be aware, um, projective measurements as we, are what we have all learned about in our early uh, quantum mechanics lectures, <coughs> but it's not what you usually have in practice. Here is a, is a way that you can actually get this projective measurement um, in a real experiment, and and, and that's uh, that's interesting because uh, uh, there are ways that you can use these projective measurements to to actually get the, um, get the dynamics, uh, coherent dynamics in a in, in a driven system that would be very difficult to get otherwise. Uh, uh, this is known by the name of quantum zero dynamics. So the uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, goes like this. So so you have. Uh, uh, you have your many particle uh, um, system evolving in some uh, uh, Hilbert space, and um, now uh, by applying continuously your your Q and D measurement, uh, you're putting a wall into this uh, into the Hilbert space uh, that the atoms can uh, can get across. Because uh, if your if your measurement tells you whether you're in the left half or in the right half, then you will continuously project onto being in that half of the space and you will actually never get to the other half. So if you have now a coherent evolution that takes place, let's say it starts here, uh, and, and the system is driven to go towards this barrier here, then interesting things will happen when it gets close to the barrier. Where in the case without the measurement it will just go across uh, and, uh, and, and evolve further. Now it can't do that, it will somehow be reflected on that barrier and what happens then? And it turns out that um, when you look at concrete cases, um, uh, it's often at this point here, close to this barrier, um, that multi-particle in entanglement will, uh, will arise all on its own. And um, this, this has been uh, explored theoretically for, for, for a number of years, and uh, recently first experiments have been, have been coming up. Uh, the first ones are you know, few single particles and, and, and these equivalent dynamics that can be come in the form of QND uh, uh, measurement. But uh, when we um, realized that we you know, could do this QND detection with our, with our cavity, we thought, can't we do such a, such a um, um, 
can't we use this detector as, as a way to get the zero dynamics and, and produce entanglement in, the, in, in an atomic system? And, um, and here's how it goes. We, uh, we take an ensemble, which in this case contains about 40 atoms, okay? um, 40 atoms sitting, sitting in the center of the cavity. We start with all uh, strips up, and then we drive, with, you know, just with microwaves, we drive coherent dynamics that normally would take you all the way to the south pole of the cavity, except uh, of the, excuse me, of the, of the block sphere, except that this, block, uh, this south pole here is blocked uh, by the fact that we are, um, we are having our, um, our cavity detection. So the atoms can't actually reach this state because that is, uh, so the probability of being there is continuously being projected to zero by the cavity. So um, what will happen? Well, somehow the, the system will go around this, uh, um, this forbidden region and, 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 and what happens there? Uh, well, it turns out that what should happen is uh, um, that at the time that you would normally be at the South Pole, instead you will be uh, in, in this uh, highly entangled state here um, called the W state, where you have exactly one uh, excited uh, atom, but you don't know which one it is. And, um, and, and so, so uh, we, we tried it, and then of course the question is how, how do you detect what you have really done? So you need to do some form of quantum tomography, and, um, and, and so the other thing that was uh, uh, interesting there was that the, the cavity actually allowed us um, to, to put in place a, uh, uh, a way of doing such a tomography uh, just, once again, just by using the cavity measurement uh, that we can do. So what is being shown here? Actually, this is a raw data. This is a, um, a maximum likelihood uh, reconstruction of the... Um, um, of the atomic uh, state of the you know, state of these, of these 40, 40 atoms in a region close to the south pole. So essentially, what you're looking at here is the is the probability distribution close to the south pole of the, of the block sphere, and so you have the, this uh, atomic distribution approaching uh, the south pole, and then you see here it forms a ring, and this this ring is uh, it indicates that uh, something <coughs> interesting is happening, and this is the um, this is actually this entangled state that we are producing. And then the question is, okay, how entangled is it really? Um, and so, uh, first thing you can first thing you can look at is, you know, what, how much overlap does it have uh, with just a plain old um, uh, coherent state? And um, turns out that um, uh, the fidelity with the closest, uh, um, I mean, the, the fidelity that we get uh, between the state that we really produce. And the target state of the W state uh, that you can you know deduce from, from, from this data here from this tomography data is 37 percent percent, and that doesn't sound like a very good number. So so um, so uh, for us at the time you know we asked her, okay so should we be happy or, or not or you know what, what's the metric? And um, so first thing uh, uh, we convinced ourselves that if, if we just had a coherent state, actually you can't get that far. The, the, um, the, the best uh, uh, the best fidelity uh, that you can get with the uh, W state by from from from, from just an unentangled uh, coherent state is, is is lower than that. But in order to be more quantitative, actually we we developed a, 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 an entanglement criterion uh, based on this um, uh, you know data that we have here. What I what I showed here, what, um, and, you know, just to be a bit more uh, precise, uh, what did I show you there? It was actually the QZ. Uh, Q distribution, uh, uh, and it turns out that you can directly measure it by the only Q distribution with the cavity. Because what is this Q distribution? It's the, it's the overlap of your density matrix with coherent state uh, of angles theta and phi. Now we can't measure at angles theta and phi. We can only measure at the south pole. But what we can do is coherently uh, rotate our our state. So actually, we um, so you, here you get a you get, you get a very um, you know. Um, uh, Intuitive uh, uh, meaning that you can give to this using EQ distribution. It's uh, the probability um, of your detector clicking after you have rotated your block sphere so that this point theta and phi is in front of your detector. Okay? So, what you have to do is to um, <coughs> rotate your block sphere, do the measurement, do that many times, 100 times for the, for the same theta and phi, and then you get some statistics, and then that gives one point of this distribution. Okay. And then if you repeat that for other theta and phi, then you get the full distribution, and that's what we did. 
And now the question uh, was, okay, so once we have this distribution, um, how much entanglement do we have um, uh, in, our, um, in our experimentally realized state? And um, of course, I mean, you, 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 you know, um, luckily we can have this losing EQ uh, close, close to the pole. Um, there's no way you could get a complete density matrix even, even for 40 atoms. Um, that is just too much, too much data. So you have to find some other way of, of characterizing your state. And uh, so what we did was to adapt a, um, uh, a, an idea that had originally been uh, developed for, for squeeze state. Uh, it's a concept of, concept of um, entanglement depth. Entanglement depth is the answer to the question of, um, you know, uh, you get an experimental result, um, uh, you have n particles, how many of these n particles need to be entangled? in order to produce this, uh, this uh, experimental result that you're seeing. Okay? What's the minimum number of entangled particles that you need in order to produce this, uh, to reproduce your experimental data? And so uh, mathematically this gets a little bit uh, involved because you have to somehow enumerate all, all your states, but um, uh, uh, Jerome Estelle uh, was known at that time um, you know, as a good uh, ENS trained uh, physicist, he was able to work that out. And here's what you get. So you, you just need to look at uh, two density matrix elements, rho zero zero, so probability of, of, of being in a long state and, and rho one one, probability of having one excitation. And then it turns out that you can't have just any combination of these two matrix elements without being entangled. And um, uh, these here are our experimental uh, um, results and you see for, um, for, for this result here, <coughs> In order to produce such a result, you need at least 16 entangled particles uh, in order to get that. Okay, and that, that now is a quantitative result, and um, uh, that's how you can see that indeed from, um, from the data that we have, we can know uh, that, um, that it's a multi-particle entangled state. Um, and actually, uh, this, this entanglement criterion that we developed there turned out to be a more successful result uh, than our, uh, I, I mean, our, our articles now uh, cited more often uh, for for the, for this concept rather rather than for the for the physics that we that, that, that we showed them which I'm you know I don't know what to think about it but anyway that's uh, what it is and and um, it had uh, in particular there are these um, these people working on quantum memories with um, uh, with erbium doped uh, crystals and um, who use our criteria to show that they have a W state with an entanglement depth uh, exceeding ten to the nine. Okay. What are our 18 particles to compared to that 10 to the 9 entangled? Uh, and so when you read that, you ask yourself, does that make sense? You know, how, how can you, what does it mean so many entangled? In what sense are they entangled? But then when you look at what, uh, what these people are doing, I mean, they are producing these um, collective states that, that um, you know, like, are like a, a phase array um, um, of, of, uh, of excitations that, that reproduce. Uh, the state of a light field that you want, then you want to, to, to recreate later on. And then you look at what, what you need in order to do that, you need the coherence between all these emitters, otherwise uh, the, your re-emission will go in the wrong direction. And, um, and actually, um, also you want uh, it to be only one excitation. You know, um, so it turns out that uh, yes, uh, what they are measuring when they are looking at the fidelity of, of recreation of the State, uh, so the fidelity of their quantum memory is actually something that is uh, um, really determined by this entanglement depth. And they need these 10 to the 9 particles so that they go to get good fidelity. And, and, and so, so you can convince yourself that yes, indeed, it, it makes sense. Okay, so I found that interesting just as a, you know, one way of seeing how, how uh, a rather simple form of entanglement can, can uh, you know, even these uh, um, improbable looking num numbers can, can, um, can, can lead to, to the very concrete result that you can experimentally see. Okay, so that was, uh, that was one experiment. And now for the last, I don't know how many minutes I have left. Uh, quick, quick question on the entanglement sure. witness, when you um, show the floor plus row versus row, um, the row has only two indices, should it have 16 indices, the element of the density matrix? Uh, for the 16 atoms, shouldn't it have 16 indices? They grow one or one? No, no, it goes higher. It goes, uh, it, it, it goes to 40. Yeah. 
Uh, but but there are only two indices on the plot. So. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So so what is rho zero zero? So you see, your basis states are, are, are zero, one, uh, and up to sixteen, and so the dens density matrix is so, uh, always have uh, you know input and output, so it's a two me matrix. So okay. so it should be two indices always, but but they can go up up, uh, up to forty. Top top line. Uh, yes, I don't know how much time I, I have left. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, the last thing I want to tell you about is what is a more recent experiment where, um, where we are now uh, once again using uh, using a cavity in a, in a more fluid regime uh, to produce another form of entanglement, spin squeezing, a uh, well, well known form of entangled state uh, which has been produced uh, before, in, uh, including here, actually the best, uh, uh, best results come, come, come from. Group and uh, and after having been uh, demonstrated for the first time by Monica, so so really this is a special place to talk about that. Um, and and uh, all we want to do is now um, uh, bring this form of entanglement really uh, onto a platform uh, where you can do uh, real clock physics. So we want to uh, to produce spin squeezing uh, in, in really in a meteorological environment, and that's, I'll show you what what kind of clock. Uh, we have, but, but just as a reminder, um, so uh, what is this about? Uh, well, once again, we uh, we take we take a block sphere, and um, suppose you want to do um, uh, clock measurement. So normally you do, you, you do Ramsey spectroscopy, and um, and the fundamental form of noise after you've eliminated all the uh, uh, all the <coughs> noise comes from the fact that if you use um, uh, independent atoms, so no correlation between atoms. What you want to measure is a, is a phase. It's a phase difference between a local oscillator and the um, and the atomic evolution, um, and and so that is a continuous variable. But when you do your measurement, each of your atoms will either be spin up or spin down, so you only get one bit uh, of information, and there is only a finite number of combinations uh, of ups and downs that you can, that you can get, and that brings in noise. It's just the same noise as in coin tossing. So if you want to know if you, if a coin is, is biased or not, uh, if you if you your, uh, your coin n times, and you get a, um, a, a, a statistic with, um, uh, with a noise of 1 over square root of n, and this is just the same noise uh, that, you, that you have um, um, in, 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 a, in a Ramsey measurement. And so uh, it has this slightly pompous noise name of, of, of uh, quantum projection noise, but as you see, I mean, it's, uh, nothing could be more classical. It's just, uh, just binomial statistics. Um, the only thing that is quantum there is, is the fact that your spin only has two. Uh, possible values. Uh, right, but this being a quantum uh, system, now uh, you can form, uh, create a form of, of correlation that you could never get in a, in a, in a classical system, uh, where uh, this noise created by the statistics is compensated for by uh, conspiration between the atoms. <coughs> uh, so if you represent it on, on a sphere, it's just you know, a, a, a rearrangement of your, of your statistical uncertainty so that it, you shuffle it away from the variable that you're interested in into another variable that you're not measuring, and here you go, uh, you, you have um, you have spin squeezing. Uh, but when you think about what, why this works, it's because um, in, in this form of entanglement, when you uh, do your final uh, measurement, uh, you measure. Uh, let, let's say you are here on the equator of your cross field, so you should get 50% spin ups, 50% spin downs. Uh, but in real measurement, let's say your, your first three spins were all spin up, okay? So it, if the atoms are uncorrelated, the fourth atom, okay, wouldn't care for that. But in, in, in the form of entanglement that you have in spin squeezing, it does. And so the fourth atom uh, will now arrange its probability for increasing its probability, it will increase its probability of being spin down, uh, so that uh, you never get uh, too far away uh, from your mean value. That's what happens in the... Uh, uh, in, in, in spin squeezing. Now, of course, you have to be careful uh, when you prepare the state. Um, you um, you could possibly um, uh, lose some of your coherence. Um, so, so the statistic is, is not everything. You also need to care uh, about the length of your spin vector, uh, which shouldn't be uh, too much. So, so in the end, there's a spin squeezing factor that, that tells you um, um, how much you actually gain with respect to um, um, the standard value that, uh, of unintended atoms. 
and it turns out that um, the scaling that you can get uh, uh, is in, in the best case can can be um, um, proportional to one over n instead of the one over square root of n that you can uh, uh, that, that you get of, uh, for unending. And it turns out that, uh, um, I mean, as Monica showed, that, that uh, the uh, one way, and uh, in many cases the best way of, of, of producing such a sweet state uh, is by using a cavity. So now the idea is this, so, so uh, now my qubit states I call the clock states, but it's the same scheme as, as before, except that now the cavity is detuned, um, uh, for example, midway between these optical transitions from the two qubit states. And so now um, uh, each atom acts like an index object and a uh, spin up atom will pull the cavity resonance in one way, and then a down atom will pull it the other way, uh, so that in the end, the transmission of your cavity will, um, um, will be proportional to, to, the, uh, to the difference um, between the atom numbers in the, in the two states. And so if you look at the transmission of the cavity, uh, then, then it will be a, a non demolition measurement of this number difference. So we will produce uh, squeezing just by, by, by looking at this um, output of, of, of the cavity, which in one realization might be here, in another realization might be further up here. Uh, but in, uh, in every realization, we'll have a noise that is below one over one square root of n. And now we want to use that in, uh, in a clock. And now, what, what kind of clock? Well, atomic clocks, uh, as you may know, they, they come in very uh, many different, different fla flavors. The ones that we hear most about um, are, are the primary standards, uh, which are currently moving from, from microwave to the, the optical regime and which uh, reach uh, breathtaking uh, precision. Uh, but there are actually, uh, the, uh, there's a whole spectrum of clocks. Clocks become, generally, uh, clocks become interesting as soon as you, they get better uh, than the quartz oscillator. The best quartz is um, maybe 10, somewhere between 10 to the minus 10, uh, 10 to the minus 11. Uh, Relative uncertainty in uh, a square root of a second. So, uh, uh, in GPS satellites, you have atomic clocks uh, which have uh, uh, 10 to the minus 12 per second. And there's currently research going on uh, for, for making compact clocks uh, that are no of length better. So, when you are in the 10 to the minus 13 uh, per second range, then you are in this range of, of current development of, of compact clocks. And um, and that's a particularly interesting range for, for spin squeezing because here you want to be compact so that favors using <coughs> atoms that are trapped and when you trap your atoms and you get interactions you don't want to increase the number of atoms so what else can you do in order to reduce the noise that's where squeezing comes into play. Uh, now this is not yet where squeezing has been applied so far uh, for example in, um, in, in Mark's lab uh, the, the, which is I think the best result that I'm aware of that um, there's proof of principle clock um, um, measurement that they did, uh, which had one second stability uh, of 9.7 times 10 to the minus 11. So uh, you see there's still uh, some way to go to, to, to go to this uh, 10 to the minus 13 range. And uh, one other um, interesting thing about that is usually when you when you go that far from 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 established uh, uh, um, you know experiments, almost two two orders of magnitude that you need to gain the precision. Um, uh, it's likely that you will also see new physics that, uh, that, have, that haven't been seen yet. So it's not just, um, you know, the one aspect that's really making something useful, the other is uh, see, seeing the, the new physics that arises then. And so, um, uh, you know, I, um, uh, for a number of years I, I, I have a collaboration with the, the, with the French um, uh, Time Frequency Standard Lab where they have um, some, some, some very good clocks and what we built together was a um, was a clock based on based on an atom chip. So so atom chips are uh, you know, an experimental technique where you use uh, wires on a chip, uh, uh, currents running through wires that produce magnetic fields to, to trap and manipulate your atoms in a in, in a very compact system. You can now buy that from from uh, from, from uh, called quanta. You can use such systems uh, to you know uh, split, transport atom clouds, etc. And and one nice thing is that you can actually oops, you can actually um, get very long coherence times, uh, uh, even though you're uh, relatively close to this uh, to the solid state surface. Um, this book is always um, and and here's the here's the clock chip that we now use in, in, in this experiment, um, where we have uh, so 
so many, many wires here that uh, serve for, for, for trapping atoms. But here is a coplanar waveguide that actually drives the, the clock transition. And what we do is we, we trap atoms here and then bring them into this region here uh, where we actually have a fiber candy. Maybe you see it better here. Uh, these are the field source again. Here you have a fiber coming in, and then uh, right in the center, uh, uh, here, here are these fiber mirrors. And you know, for fiber cavity, this is a really long um, uh, distance here. We needed to make it that, that long um, so that we can make an elongated uh, atom cloud where the density is low enough so that we can use it as a clock without having too much interactions between the atoms. And then we drive a clock transition that is a two problem transition between these states here in, in, in the really matrix 7. And what we had seen already a number of years ago is that uh, you get a surprisingly long coherence time um, in, in such a clock, actually much longer than what we originally expected. Uh, and, and, and this coherence actually comes from interaction between the atoms. I'll say just uh, two more words about that in, in a minute. But what we're doing now, okay, is, is to, to, to add to this established system um, our cavity with, with these parameters here. Uh, in order to create spin squeezing as I uh, that we used just before. So why do we get these uh, these non coherence times here? Well, um, uh, that has to do with um, with uh, quantum statistics in atomic collisions. So we, we use these trapped atoms. Okay, uh, they are in some spin state um, uh, that that we need uh, for, uh, for the clock. They are subject to a little bit of of, of dephasing due to the due to the uh, trapping potential, and now what happens is that um, uh, uh, co collision statistics are such that um, um, uh, you know your collision and interaction um, is uh, is a little bit dependent on um, on the on on, uh, on your on your spin state, and and that leads to uh, an interaction that. Um, that drives spins out of the equatorial plane when you uh, uh, when you have dephasing. So suppose that you have just two atoms, uh, they dephase a little bit, and um, without interactions, okay, um, uh, they, they will just go on dephasing. But with these interactions now, uh, the two spins start to rotate about the sum of the two. Sum must be conserved because uh, you know, the total spin is conserved. Uh, but this rotation is is the effect. Um, um, of the exchange interaction. And um, uh, this effect now, in, in the context of the clock, where we are on the equator, um, acts like a, a, a spin echo. Um, you know, spin echo is when you, when you drive high pulses in order to undo uh, the phasing. Except that here we don't have, even have to do any external pulses. Uh, uh, the phasing undoes itself due to this rotation. So we have, uh, so what happens is this, atoms deface, but then they rotate, and then the faster will catch up with the slower one uh, to, to, to undo the deface. And actually when you, you know, depending on uh, the time scales of the different effects, actually they will never uh, be able to deface in the first place to do that effect. And that's why we get this long coherence time um, in the clock, so that's a nice thing. And there's another way you can see it, but I think I'm running out of time. So, um, uh, of course, um, if you want to be serious about clock, then, then, then you need to, 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 to measure your L invariant. So we did that with this new experiment. Good news is that with the, uh, in, in spite of the, the cavity and all this other stuff that we now put into the experiment, we still get a, um, uh, we still get a, um, an L invariant as, uh, 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 as we had before in the mid 10 to the minus 13 range uh, per second with a Ramsey time uh, which is one, one second. And now the question is, can we improve that by using spin squeeze? And um, in, in order to see, uh, you know, at least theoretically, if that is possible, you have to look at um, uh, you have to look at the noise contributions that that that, that make you end up with this uh, 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 with this curve here. And I don't want to get in, into the details, but the important thing is that uh, it turns out that in our clock, the quantum projection noise, this red curve here, is the dominant contribution. Um, over some range of, of parameters. Here, here is the total uh, calculated noise, and here's the contribution of quantum projection noise. And, and one point I'd like to make for, for, for the experts among you, you know, usually uh, then you would say, okay, so if I, if I take away uh, this projection noise by introducing squeezing, 
Uh, okay, so then my sum, my total sum will go down by the corresponding amount, and, and that's it. Uh, but what we realized while, while doing this is that it becomes even better because once you have gotten rid of, of, of projection noise, actually your accessible range widens up, and you see that um, if you take away, in uh, our, in our, um, um, supposing that you take away the quantum projection noise, then the resulting uh, total noise is now a, a much flatter permanently formed. And so over all this uh, wide region here, uh, it's essentially the same, okay? So before we only had this narrow region here, now we have this much larger region of, of Ramsey times that is accessible. And that has practical consequences uh, that are beneficial. It means that now we can get the same flow stability with much shorter Ramsey time. And that means that we can use a local oscillator uh, that is less stable because we can correct it more often. And that's something that uh, clock people are really uh, happy about. Um, so now we want to see if we can actually uh, put squeeze on, on the clock. So we transport the atoms in, in, into the cavity, which we first pile the two parts. And then the way uh, that we do it is simply we measure, we measure our cavity transmission. That gives us um, the, the atom number difference. And then we repeat the measurement in order to see how well uh, it is reproduced with the second uh, measurement. And so here's, here's the result as a function of the number of detected photons. So the longer we make the pulse, of course, the, um, the lower the noise that comes just from the uh, limited number of photons. And the good news is that um, um, for all these photon numbers here, we're finding results that are uh, below zero here, meaning that they are below uh, the noise that you would get for, um, for independent atoms. So this shows that these uh, atom number results are it doesn't yet show the full thing because we also need to care for coherence and indeed the more photons we use we do get the, um, um, some, 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 uh, some loss of coherence here here's the coherence as a, as a function of the number of photons and if we factor that in uh, then we get this real meteorological gain uh, which is up to 8 dBs in, uh, in our clock and 8 dBs that's by far good enough to you know make uh, one projection noise uh, negligible in this in this uh, uh, in this noise graph that I showed, that I showed before. So that's good news. And, and, and that's how where we are concerning intermittent squeezing. We still have to do the, the, uh, the clock measurement with these uh, squeezed atoms now. But we got sidetracked by, uh, by the fact that we saw new physics arising due to the uh, atomic interactions once again. Actually, um, what is shown here is based on, on, on uh, repeating the measurements uh, right after the first measurement. We can also wait before we do the second measurement. And then we have a surprise. Actually, the, uh, the, uh, what we see in the second measurement depends on how long we have waited. And when you look at um, uh, the, uh, the uh, correlation between these measurements, actually, uh, the correlation is still there. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, the, you know, the, the factor that you that you have now it, between um, the actual number difference and the cavity transmission has increased. So it's as if our second num uh, experiment was amplified. So how do we see that from the actual experiment? So here's what you here's what you really measure. Uh, this is the noise of, um, of of the individual measurement that you see that for the second measurement. Uh, as a function of uh, photon number, it goes up. That could just mean that you have some more technical noise, but actually when you look at the correlation um, between the first and second measurement, again, as we, as, as we did before, but now uh, the, first, the, the second measurement is divided by the factor that you get from, from the slope of this curve, then you realize that you reproduce full correlation uh, as you did for, 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 for zero delay. So these Measurements are, are still full, fully correlated. Um, it's just that the second is, a, is an amplified version of the first. And this amplification factor de depends on how long you wait. Uh, it's close to one when you, when you have a short delay, then it goes to a maximum, and then it goes down again. And, and, and this is a result uh, of the same uh, uh, spin exchange interaction um, uh, that I've talked about before. Um, it has interesting consequences um, because, in some, in some sense, it means that you're now no longer limited by, uh, by, by the photon short noise. I don't 
quite understand uh, how, how this is possible. Maybe uh, you understand better than, uh, than I do. Anyway, uh, this is closely related to something that, 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 that Monica has um, uh, 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 found for the, for, for the first time, uh, based on a different interaction. Um, so, so this is another form of, of, um, uh, of one phase magnification that, that we now get uh, due to this exchange interaction. So my, um, this is my last point here. Uh, what is the explanation that we um, um, that explains what's going on here? Well, uh, the thing is, is um, it, it, it so happens that in our experiment, uh, the size, the transverse size of the atomic uh, ensemble is is, uh, is fairly close to the transverse size of the mole. That means that the that the coupling um, is not exactly the same for all atoms. And atoms that have a small oscillation amplitude, or low temperature, if you like. Uh, they are better coupled to the cavities than the ones that are all right. Okay, so that means now that the different different atoms, uh, um, and, and, uh, you know, okay, and I should say that there, there is some residual phase shift caused by this uh, uh, by this measurement, and this phase shift now obviously uh, is also um, uh, um, related to, the, to this coupling to the cavity. So meaning that uh, the cold atoms get a little bit more phase shift than the hot ones. And so now you are once again in the situation where you have a phase shift on the, on, on the equator, and so now um, you, you, you get this uh, exchange interaction turning, uh, turning your spins out of the equator. So what was initially uh, the phase difference is now converted into a number difference. But that is the parameter that, on, uh, um, uh, that we want to measure with our cavity. And so you, know, you, you end up in a situation uh, where the spin ups have a better coupling to the cavity than the spin downs, and that is what causes the amplification. Due to the fact that you convert, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, <coughs> and, uh, into one dependent phase shift in, 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 into, a, into a corresponding population difference, which you then detect in the, in the second measure. So the, um, we are uh, right now in the process of transforming these ideas into a more, uh, into a more serious uh, model. Um, I'm not quite sure yet whether this will uh, end up being useful uh, for, the, for the talk, but um, if it's not, um, the, the reassuring thing is that we can also turn it off by, by uh, de depending on how we do our individual uh, clock measurements. And so that's where we are right now. And um, just in case you're curious, uh, uh, what's going on in our, in our group? I mean. Uh, one thing I'd, uh, I'd like to get to at, at one stage is an idea that originally comes from, from Vlad Vujicic's slam. Uh, if you generalize this idea of the, of the cavity as a, as, a, as a thicker state detector, you realize that actually, I mean, as thicker states form a basis um, of your, um, of your uh, states, the symmetric states um, um, of the atomic ensemble, uh, by driving a cavity with a superposition of different probe frequencies, you can actually put your project your atomic ensemble into a, into a superposition of thicker states, that means that you can produce a fairly general class of, of entangled states by driving a cavity with a, a single photon that is in a, in a superposition of frequencies. That's really cool. That's something I'd like to see in, in an experiment. And in order to, that, to do that, you have to further improve the, 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 um, you know, the, the cavity so that you can do that with an uh, acceptable Fidelity, that's something that's going on. And the experiment that we have underway uh, co combines a fiber cavity um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and lattice inside the cavity where you, where you run up your atoms. We want to work in a regime where you have exactly one or I mean, a maximum of one atom per, uh, per lattice side so that we can treat them as, as qubits and uh, individually address them by, by an addressing beam. That, and, and the spatial resolution, both for the addressing and for the for the readout, will come from the asperic lens that I've shown on the on one of the first slides. Um, so this is slowly uh, coming online. We, uh, we can uh, right now we are in a state where we can do uh, CQED with that experiment, but we haven't we haven't used the, uh, the imaging yet. Will come in another experiment. Um, uh, we're, we're using an uh, alpha and earth. Uh, atom to, uh, for cavity QED because then you can have an optical qubit and, you, um, and the physics, the, the cavity physics uh, become quite, quite different uh, because you can now uh, 
go to a regime where you essentially infinitely detune from one of the qubit states while you do uh, CQED uh, on the other. And, uh, and the other thing, of course, is that it's practically relevant because spin squeezing uh, will be uh, especially important for, for, for uh, next generation uh, primary clocks uh, using atoms like, uh, like Stronson. In order to put it in such a, um, in this environment, uh, uh, what we came up with as a, as a cavity is actually a ring cavity, a miniature ring cavity, um, for reasons that I don't want to bother you with. Uh, this, this is here. Here's a photo of such a micro ring cavity. This is a fiber here, and the cavity is a triangular cavity. And with that, I'm finished, and I'd uh, like to uh, acknowledge my, my family the group. It's not usually as large as that. That was last summer when we had a lot of interns, so usually we are only half as many. And right now, we are uh, still a bit less because uh, actually we have, we have uh, a poster's position open. So that, uh, if you know somebody who's interested, uh, please tell me. Yeah, thanks for your attention. So with the carving scheme, I imagine you could possibly project into a Dickey state, for example, a Dickey state where half the atoms are excited into the qubit, which would, or into the one qubit state, so like a ring around the equator. So the Dickey state has maximal narrowness in its width, but I've never actually understood if it can be useful for something because of its narrowness. Uh, so, so actually, can it be used for, uh, for enhancing uh, clocks? That's its you, you mean when you, when you have just a single Dickey state? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a general answer. I mean, um, I, all I can tell you is why it's no longer, uh, why, why it's not useful to push spin squeezing all the way to, to the Dicke state, because then you get a phase ambiguity when you, when you project uh, on, onto the z-axis, right? right? So, um, actually, um, at, at some stage, you do need to worry about what, uh, you know, what the, 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 the simple narrative that, that I made uh, was, okay, we're measuring SC, so we don't care what uh, the uncertainty is along the other axis. But, but you end up caring uh, for it, and you can you can see when, when, when you turn it now. Uh, in this case, you would get one block here, one block down there, and then you have to worry about that. But maybe there are other ways of using it for metrology. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I can actually comment that. Yes. I think one, one paradigm for using that state <coughs> is to have it by default spin squeezing, and then you can measure not the average along this direction, but the fluctuations. So if it moves this okay. way, the fluctuations decrease. Can they, can it achieve Heisenberg scaling? Yes. It can. Yeah. Well, this following about the squeezing, how well preserved is the area? The second area of this. Okay, uh, okay, so we, we did uh, we did noise tomography, but I don't know you the result. I mean, we, we, we certainly have much more noise than, uh, um, than you know, than the raw limit. Um, uh, but I'm sorry, I know I'm, I can't tell you how much. Can I ask a question about the, the Zeno effect? So I often am confused sure. by the quantum zero dynamics. Is it is it correct to understand it as projecting out of the Hilbert space the the state with all zeros, and then also projecting that term out of the Hamiltonian, and then its coherent evolution with the remaining terms of the Hamiltonian, or is it something more subtle? Oh, uh, I think it depends on what you mean. Uh, okay. Um, the you, you you can describe the dynamic. Okay, you, you, yeah, you can. Um, how would you do that? I mean, uh, uh, say, say again how how you wanted to describe it. So, is, is it fair to understand it as uh, truncating the Hilbert space to not include the the state that is blocked off by the Zeno measurement? Yes, absolutely. And then to yeah. remove like project out corresponding terms in the Hamiltonian, you evolve under all other couplings that exist, but just no couplings to this uh, block. Yeah, you can it, yeah. And then the that's that's cool. this is what Xavier you just found, that's kind of too fast as you would. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Some of your photos of the fiber cavity fibrosis stick out in its mouth. How much 
Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 okay we tried to see, um, uh, okay, in, in, in one early experiment, uh, we, we, we saw some, some uh, resonant sideband that we wondered uh, whether it would be caused by that. Um, uh, but in the in, in this experiment that we, that, that we now have that I uh, that I showed you, um, it sticks out quite a lot. Um, where was it? This one, yes. 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 Uh, it sticks out, but um, you know, I mean, you don't see it very well here. But actually, this um, this V group that it holds, it goes goes all the way to here. So it actually sticks out only by this by this amount, and. Um, uh, there, I mean, we estimated that the frequencies that you expected from that, and we tried to see them in the spectrum, but we saw no trace of them. I mean, to f first order, of course, it's, um, you know, you would need you would need such a uh, such a motion, in, in, um, okay, that that you can get, but 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 what would change the resonance would be this. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe this is why it's uh, it's sensitive. In your clock qubit, what's the residual magnetic field dependent? So, I mean, they have probably the similar <coughs> symmetry, right? The two states. Yeah, actually, okay, okay, I didn't go into these details, but um, yeah, well, you, um, you, you get a quadratic dependence. So it's only quadratic. It's only really quadratic, really. yes, that's why you have, to, you have to work at one particular magnetic field, uh, you know, called, called the magic field in that, uh, in, in, in that context of about three uh, Gauss, and then um, the linear. Um, uh, differential Zeeman effect is zero. But actually, we don't work at that particular point because we also have a collisional shift. And so uh, it turns out that you can uh, part partially compensate the collisional shift with this magne uh, magnetic shift by going to a, to a field that is slightly away from the magic. And that's what we do. That's where we work. Yeah, have you ever thought about optically trapping them and then using the independence of the magnetic insensitive states? So. Well, um, not so easy with uh, not so easy with the video, right? And that's what you would do with uh, that's what you would do with Swanson, yes. I'm not sure there's such, such a magic wavelength for uh, um, hyperfine ground state, such as in the video. But anyway, I mean, you know, uh, on, with this atom chip platform, um, we're pretty happy with what uh, you know. With, we're not so keen on introducing yet another. Yet, yet another form of interaction. What, what we're, um, the, the limits actually uh, in this talk come from temperature. So temp there, there's, a, um, um, there's an overall shift, okay, which doesn't bother us as long as it's constant, but it has a slight uh, temperature dependence, and that is what uh, uh, you know, uh, determines the long-term drift of the experiment. I've been talking here about about the short term effects, that uh, there the quantum injection noise is involved, but then you have, um, you know, what, how far can you integrate down? That's limited by temperature. Yes? Other questions for Jakob? Otherwise, let's thank him again. Uh,